Um, I just have uh, a few announcements today. So we have a little more than one month remaining before the end of unit two. And um, so now is an ideal time, even if you are, let's say, behind on your assignments. Uh, we still have a decent amount of time to get caught up. So if you are worried that you're too far behind, uh, you're not. But now is is the time to kind of rally, get in touch with your TAs or get in touch with me and figure out a good way to catch up and um, get caught up on the assignments, get caught up on, on maybe concepts that are fully fleshed out, even though... Um, I, I think it's it's pretty safe to assume that nobody's that getting a full mastery of everything in Java is, is not the expectation, but um, there's definitely plenty of things to to um, brush up on as you go and and uh, essential things that get missed along the way. And, and that happens. So just make sure. And if you feel like that applies to you, reach out to your TAs or, or shoot me a DM and we'll figure out how to get you back on track. Uh, we also have the alumni panel on Thursday, and I just ask that people try to get here as close to possible to 5.30 as you can, or just get here at 5.30. How about that? Um, because we are booked for about an hour, um, and we have some good people coming in and want to be respectful of their time and try to get started right on time. And... Uh, yeah, come prepared with some some questions about their experiences. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So uh, I definitely want to have everybody air all their, the questions they might have about the apprenticeship process or about what people did uh, immediately after launch code. Um, and with that, have a great rest of your night. And TAs, I'll be opening up a uh, room for the TA meeting now. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Colin. All right. Okay. Um, we are continuing our quest <laughs> into um, working mm -hmm. through uh, models with Spring. So uh, tonight we're gonna talk about how to validate um, when you're working with models um, and also we'll uh, introduce the concept of enumeration types. Okay, so we're gonna lecture. You guys are gonna have studio. The studio is in chapter 15, not in chapter 16. Um, yeah, Colin just mentioned the alumni panel on Thursday and um, those guys will be great. Uh, great assignment deadline is the 23rd. Um, and then uh, the intro video for <laughs> great assignment three. Uh, you may have noticed, I don't have that out yet. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I've been uh, juggling a lot of things, um, but you know, no excuses. I will get it out, hopefully, tomorrow, which will still give you plenty of time to work on it. But tonight is the last uh, class that you need for the concepts to do graded assignment three. So you should be able to start at any time. So I will try to get that to you tomorrow um, so that that'll help you get started. Okay, let's talk about mo model validation. Um, this is how you validate user input on the server side with Spring Boot. So we'll talk about uh, the concept of it, and then we'll go through the particulars, the syntax um, that you need in the model, the controller, and the view, because it requires changes to all three parts um, to make this work. All right, so um, the basic concept here is that uh, when you have users uh, involved, users are humans, and therefore errors get introduced, right? <laughs> so um, you can have a number of ways in which bad data can screw up the application um, that might cause errors immediately, or they might cause errors a long time from now when that data is, is needing to be used and pulled back out of some database somewhere, um, and suddenly it's not formatted the way it needs to be. So uh, here are some examples. You could have like a blank or an empty value, um, a number that's out of range, an email address that's improperly formatted, password that doesn't meet the security criteria, um, or maybe a string that contains specific characters that are not usable. Um, so you wanna make sure that you validate it before you store it. So we put a number of things in place um, and there's certainly 
as we have seen in the past, you can do that on the client side. Um, and the browser even has built-in things like you saw last time where, um, you know, you can just say type equals email on an input and the browser will actually, you know, make sure that it's at least got an at symbol somewhere in the middle. Um, but we want to do more than that. So uh, we're going to, yeah, so here's some examples, empty string, blank, a number that's out of range. Maybe you're missing the dot com. That's something the browser does not catch, but you could actually catch it with um, with spring validation. Um, a password that's not strong enough, you know, a character that's not allowed. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between the client side and server side. Um, when you have uh, client side validation, that means it's done on the front end before an HTTP request is even made to the back end. Um, so HTML attributes like min, max, required, things that you put on the inputs um, themselves in the HTML, that uh, is one example of that. Um, front end frameworks have built in tools um, that will do it, Angular, React, all of them. Um, but server side of the validation, on the other hand, actually takes place in the back end and uh, allows you to you know, receive the HTTP request with the data from the front, from the browser, um, but then you know, check it before actually storing the data and then you know, just keep asking them to correct it before you actually go through with storing it. Um, so you kind of could see you know, there's these two models here, right? Um, one model would be to have a separate front end application with like React or Angular or something, Svelte. And then on the back, you've got your API that it's accessing to get to the back end application in the database. But we are working with an MVC app where we have our view controller and model and database are all gonna be connected by the time we get done at the end of the unit. Um, and the user's interacting with that. So uh, everything needs to be really handled on the back. So uh, let's see, I think I have one more. Two more bullet points. Yeah, so really ideally validation is done on both sides. Um, what we are gonna be concentrating on since right now we are building a backend application, we're gonna concentrate on that server side validation and show you how it's done using the tools that Spring makes available to you and Timeleaf as well. They work in concert with one another. So here's how the flow works um, with all the three parts. So you can uh, do this by defining the rules in the model. So this is where the model gets involved. You can say, I've got all these fields that are part of the object that's gonna be created from this class. Each of these fields may have specific rules that I wanna apply. I can define those you know, over here in the model. Um, and then, uh, you can enable and handle validation using a couple of uh, quick little tricks in the controller. Um, and there's of course lots of annotations involved in all, all of this. Uh, and those are two different things, enabling and handling. So I'm gonna kind of go through that um, when we get into the details. Uh, and then if something doesn't pass, you can actually send error messages to the view um, so the user knows what they did wrong and what they need to do differently. And you generally, um, you know, this all will work together. We're gonna to cover one piece at a time, but oh yeah, make sure that you have the right dependency in your build.gradle file. Um, and that is the dependency right there. It's also in your book. Um, and then you will actually have access to all the moving parts that we're gonna talk about with the syntax. Okay, so look at, uh, again here, we've kind of got a user interacting with the view, right? So maybe they were, they, you know, submit a form, we have a post request that comes in, the controller actually has enabled validation um, so that it can check the model for the rules. But um, so it does that, it goes over and checks the rules, it returns the rules, the error messages that uh, may be defined as part of the rules here. And then it handles all of that and decides, do we display the content and, you know, with a su successful submission, and if we had a database, we would also be saving, you know, saving that data all the way to the database. Or uh, do we send them back to the form and let them keep filling it out and finishing it, right? So that's where the controller is kind of, um, again, it's a traffic cop, right? We have these HTTP requests, and um, but the model is that where all the definition of the structure and the rules um, exist. Those are our Java classes. Okay, so that's kind of the big picture, all right? Let's uh, actually get into the details. Let's first talk about the annotations you use in the model to define these rules. All right. 
So you can define the rules of annotations. Some of them have arguments, some of them don't, um, but they all have an optional argument to define a message. And this is what's really super useful um, because you can make a very concise, user-friendly and specific message about that field that uh, can get passed automatically all the way from the model through the controller to the view to be displayed for the users uh, right next to the input field. Um, so uh, we're gonna look at how to, how to set that up. And then you can apply more than one annotation to a field. Um, you may want something to not only, you know, be um, uh, an email address, you wanna validate it on the basis of does it have the right format for an email, but maybe you have like other constraints, like how long it is or something like that. Um, so this will uh, define the rules, but it doesn't make it happen. Again, you remember I said that in the controller, we have to enable and handle, right? So the controller is where we're going to enable it to happen, but we can define it to our heart's content first in the model. Here are some of the most common annotations that you can apply to some of these fields in, in your Java class. Um, you can have uh, at size, which takes uh, different arguments like min, max, and message. Um, you don't have to use both min and max. You can just use one of them. But the important thing, and by the way, guys, I didn't I actually did not know this until this week. Like, um, I didn't know this last time I taught this. There's a difference between when you choose to use size or min and max. And that difference is that size is meant for strings, arrays, and collections. And min and max are meant for number types. So uh, if you ever try to use min or max on a string field um, and it doesn't work, that's why. You want to use size instead. So uh, these lets you kind of control uh, how like the minimum uh, size, like say you have a password and you want to make sure that it's at least eight characters long, you can use, you know, size and set min to eight. Um, and uh, likewise, you want to, your database can only handle something up to so many characters for a field. Uh, and that's, you know, somewhere in some stored procedure that's, you know, all uh, defined on, on the back, way, way back on the database. Um, this, then you have to make sure to enforce that at the point at which you're deciding whether to store the information or not. Um, formatting at email will actually go beyond what the browser does. Uh, it will uh, make sure that it has a .com or whatever on there, so it's pretty um, handy. And then um, if you want to just say this thing can't be blank or it can't be null, um, then you would use these. And of course, on all of these, you see this message parameter I was talking about where you can define a very specific message and just put it in quotes. Um, obviously, for the sake of space, I just have empty strings, but you would want to put a message there. Um, and that will get passed all the way to the front uh, as part of what we're going to set up here. Okay, so um, we're going to practice using some of these. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's go ahead and go and take a, a look at our code here and look at our artwork uh, model, our class. And you remember we have um, our D IDs, but we have the input fields are for uh, title and artist, right? So we want to go ahead and add validation rules um, that then later Spring will be able to use at the controller level to check those rules and decide whether something has met the criteria or not. So for title and artist, we want to uh, use the message parameter. Title should not be blank and artist needs to be two to three two to 30 characters long, no less than two, um, no more than 30. So um, we can set this up by putting an annotation right here on title. We can just say uh, not blank. This is one of them. And um, you have to import this just like you do a lot of annotations. So if you, if it comes up like this, once you have the, um, once you have your build updated with that dependency, this, this should pop up. And then you can just tab over and say, not blank. Um, and of course I want to at minimum use a message here. So I'm gonna say message equals title is required. I'm gonna keep it short and sweet, right? Um, that's all that's really needed there. Uh, no semicolon on the end of annotations. I know it, it's tempting to do that because it actually takes arguments, but there is no, um, no semicolon here. Okay, so that's title. That's all we need to do for title, but for, um, artist, we said we wanted to make sure that it was uh, constrained to a particular size. So in this case, I want to use both, there we go, 
both min and max. So I'm going to say uh, min equals two, max equals 30. And message is going to be uh, artist's name <laughs> must be two to 30 characters long. And that's it. Um, okay, so later, some of these to do's are for later. Um, let's go ahead and take this one off. By the way, guys, I meant to mention this earlier, but I'm, if you haven't, uh, if I haven't shown this to you before, and if you haven't discovered this, there's a to do pane down here that you can open up. And every single to do you've got in your code, you can find it really easily. You just come in and, um, you know, expand these until you see all of them. And mm -hmm. you can see we have, you know, 12 more to do's to do tonight. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, and you can jump to them like this. So it's pretty handy. Okay. So, uh, we are going to, we are, we are done with setting the rules. That's all we really needed to do, um, for now. So, like I said, we've set these, but if we were to run the program right now, and we probably should, so let me get it up and running. All right, so let's say we come over to our artwork section and we go to our ad artwork form, which is the one we were working on. And I leave these blank uh, and I hit add. Look what happened, right? So I might have rules defined in the model, but I am not enabling them and I am certainly not enforcing them. For that, we need to uh, do some work in the controller. So to validate in the controller, um, you have to use the valid annotation uh, on the parameter uh, inside your handler, and that will activate these checks and make sure that um, they are actually being paid attention to. So you've already defined them, but it doesn't pay attention unless you add at valid. Uh, and then um, sometimes if you're not handling the validation, uh, you might just get, oh, oh yes, okay, right. So part one, enabling. But part two is is handling. So we might enable it, and we can do that now and run it. But we're we're going to get a message, uh, an error message, this white label error page. Once we do, because we have uh, enabled it, but we haven't handled it. So let's go over here to the uh, artwork controller, and um, come down here and just say uh, on yes, our our uh, post handler here for the form. We actually want to just put um, at valid right before the name of the class that's to be validated uh, before that model. Um, so this is the artwork mar model that has those rules and we're saying, okay, we're turning this on. We're going to um, you know, enable this, right? Uh, let me rerun it and we'll come over here and try running this again. Of course, okay, there we go. All right, there's that error page, right? So I've enabled it, but it says you're not doing anything with it, right? So let's talk about how to do that. If you wanna handle it, you have to add a little bit of logic inside your handler method. So first you need this parameter errors um, that is of the errors class. Uh, so we're gonna add that as one of the parameters for the handler. And then in the body, we can access that errors object and use the method has errors uh, to basically return true or false. Were there errors? Uh, based on the rules that are in the model, did you find any errors? Um, and then that'll return true or false. And if so, you can send the user back to the form to, to keep, keep working on it and get it right. And uh, eventually we'll be passing along those error messages to the view as well. Um, otherwise, you just you know store the data and redirect them to wherever they're supposed to go from there. Um, and you wanna think about user experience, right? It's not just about having the correct routing so you don't have white label error pages. It's actually about making sure that they aren't frustrated by uh, you know, trying, to, trying to get it right and they don't know what's going on. Um, so you, you make sure that the uh, inputs will still have the same values as they did before. Um, by, and we're, we're gonna work that out with a little bit of binding. Um, and you can send a generic error message to the template overall and just say, hey, this, there's some errors here, <laughs> but that's not necessarily really helpful when you have multiple input fields. So you can be you know, very specific by using those custom defined error messages in the model that we put on with that message parameter. Um, and then every single field has its own specific message, much, much better. Um, okay, so um, 
let's do this part and then we can talk about what you do in the template in the view to bring it all to the to the very front we're just going to work on the middle now so in this controller and i'm going to um put that away all right uh we want to um come over first and we said we needed to add uh at errors I'm sorry, not at errors, my bad. It's a class, it's just a class. There we go, errors, errors, I'm just typing it. Okay, I'm, I'm giving errors the type of the class error. And actually that's not a class, it's a, um, I, think, I think it's an interface. All right, so here we can, uh, this is where we can add our, our object. We Remember I said we would use this errors object and actually use the has errors method on it to return that Boolean true or false. So I can say if errors has errors, and then in that case, um, I want to send them back to the page, but then I could say, otherwise, let's go ahead with what we were doing before and send them, you know, on forward where they're supposed to be going. We, we save the data, which right now, remember we have this uh, data layer here, that's a special Java class we're using it in place of having a database since we don't have a database right now. Um, that just temporarily saves it for us. Um, so we'll do that, we'll save it, and then we will redirect them to the artworks page where they can see the new information that they just added along with any existing information in that table. But we want to handle these errors. So if errors has errors, instead we're going to um, return artworks um, slash add, which is the path to the, the add template down here and it's basically just sitting them right back where they came from. It's going to call this, um, it's going to actually call this particular handler and just send them back here. So this is where uh, things get interesting um, because we want to make sure that they end up back there. But you remember I said that we, uh, you know, needed to have a way for them to actually um, be able to see the value of the thing that they had already put in and get that back on this page, um, there's gonna be a way to handle that. So uh, right now, we just need to talk about binding first. So we're gonna do that in a minute. Right now, let me just rerun it and we'll see um, if we have successfully not only enabled it, but if we successfully handle it. All right, so I'm gonna go back to here. Uh, cancel. I want to do it this way instead. There we go. Okay. So let's say right now I try to add this. You'll notice nothing's happening except for you can kind of see in, in a split second. Um, it's like refreshing it because it's just sending us back here. But if I do it correctly and I actually put in some, you know, values here, it goes through like it's supposed to. So our logic works. Um, the only problem is we don't have any feedback for the user yet because we've defined those messages in the model and we've enabled all of this and we've even handled the logic, but the view doesn't know about it yet. So let's talk about that now. In order to um, do this, you actually have to make more adjustments in all three places, not just in the view. Um, but uh, up until now, um, I wanted to distinguish between the setup for actually just um, enabling and handling the errors versus uh, really being able to like grab those user messages, put them on the page. Um, we're gonna we're gonna do a little bit extra to fill this out. Okay, so in the model, we want to add a no arg constructor constructor that doesn't initialize any of the fields. Um, so we're gonna separate out uh, some of the things from our existing constructor right here. Um, above this, I'm gonna create um, public artwork and then give it at no arguments. And what I'm gonna do is instead just move up um, this one and this one so that if we cre create an object of the artwork class without actually passing anything in, it'll give it an ID so that it you know exists and it exists, but it won't actually have any data set like title and artist, and it allows us to do that. And the reason that we want to do this is because we actually want to um, 
pass this an object like this that has no title or you know it has no inf actual information from the user yet we want to pass it to the uh form when the form first loads before the user even interacts with it just so the form will have knowledge of the model it knows exactly what fields they are and it can actually bind um, the fields to the model so um in our controller we're going to come over here and uh, right here, we have a to-do that says, pass an empty artwork object to the template. And now that we have created that no arg constructor, we can do this. So here, um, we're just going to add, let me get the right, here we go, yeah, add model model. And then we'll use uh, model dot add attribute. And we're just gonna say, uh, we could give it a name, but it doesn't really matter. We're just going to um, pass new artwork. It just needs to know about it. It needs to know, um, you know what? That's uh, not right. <laughs> there we go. Parentheses, not brackets. Okay. Um, it just needs to know what, what the artwork um, class has. What are its fields? Uh, and so this is a simple way to do that, that Spring allows you to give it that information ahead of time when the form first loads with the get handler so that when um, they go to submit it, uh, there's going to be easier ways for us to handle all of this error validation. Okay, so we've done that part. We created the noarg constructor in the model. We uh, changed the get handler for the form so that we could actually give it knowledge of that class ahead of time. Um, and so now we're going to go over to the template and actually replace the type and the name attributes with th field. And if you have an ID on there for any reason, it'll replace that as well. Um, and then it will will be able to bind uh, to the corresponding field in the model. Um, and yes, okay, I forgot about this note. So uh, th field provides input with the name and the ID attribute. This is actually what I just said. Um, and we could actually use the dev tools to see this. So let's go over and make this change um, to our actual view. So we're going to go to this add form. All right, we've got some to do's here. I'm going to get rid of this uh, so we can see everything. Okay. Um, if we wanted to have like a general uh, errors object just to see that that's working, uh, we could have that here. I'm actually going to skip this part so we can just focus on the way that you really want to ultimately do it, which is um, to just do the binding for each one. Okay, so we can actually change these input um, tags, like all of the attributes in these tags, and make them work uh, directly with Spring. So I'm going to replace, you see I have um, ID is title, name is title, type is text. You also notice um, I've done my labels a little bit differently than some of the examples you might see in uh, your, your book or some of these other projects or, or your studios. Um, sometimes they don't do it this way. They actually wrap the label around the input. And when you do that, then the browser knows what belongs with what. But if you choose to do it for formatting purposes, which is why I'm doing it this way, and you actually separate them out and don't wrap one inside the other, then you have to actually um, say, the ID of this input is title, and this label is for the input that has the ID of title. So that's what this is. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna find out just in a second how this works when we do it with uh, Timely. So I'm basically going to say, I want TH field, um, a special Timely attribute, and I'm going to use uh, quotes. And then inside the quotes, we'll have um, a variable expression, time leaf variable expression that uh, accesses the artwork object that's been passed in and just says artwork, you know, dot. And in this case, um, it's the title, so dot title. Um, this binds this together to where it knows uh, all the way here, it knows exactly what field of the model that that's being bound with, because we already told it about the model when we loaded the page. Uh, and you'll notice that IntelliJ is getting a little cranky about um, this now because we don't have an ID explicitly on here called title. Um, it'll still work, but if you want to make IntelliJ happy, you can just use TH4 and then it clears up. Uh, and 
it'll still work. But you don't want to do the binding like this or then it won't work. You still want, because as we're gonna see when I show you what this looks like in the dev tools, um, the ID will actually be on this input because TH field is gonna do that for us. It just does it behind the scenes and then we see the result in the browser. So that ID will still be there. And so four will still be able to connect these, this label with this input. And it's actually um, helpful for a number of reasons, but I'll, I'll show you in a second how that works. Okay, so let's do the same thing here. I'm gonna change that and then I'm gonna replace all of this with TH field and um, just add artwork dot artist instead. Okay, so already um, that means, this means that we will be able to um, have uh, those associated. And so that way, if we have to start over, at least we won't have to type those things back in. Let's demonstrate this um, by restarting this. And this time, um, I'm going to actually open up the dev tools so we can see this. Uh, let's go over to elements and uh, let me restart this. Let me, let me go here. All right, I'm gonna choose um, to show this input right here. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so you can see right here, this input has an ID of title and a name of title because we used TH field and bound it together with the title um, property of the <laughs> right. Um, so let's go and try this. I'm going to put in a title and say the Starry Night, and I'm going to uh, try to submit it without an artist. Okay. So you'll notice that it refreshed, but it kept the Starry Night in there for us. It, it managed to save that value for us, and that's because we bound it with th field. Uh, Melanie, you got a quick question. Sorry, yeah. Um, what about um, when you're doing that? Does it not give it a type anymore? Um, so uh, you can replace it on uh, text inputs because it has, in, uh, in inputs have um, the type of text by default. So then you okay. only have to you only have to specify it if it's something other than just regular text. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. I think my slide is a little bit misleading and that's a good point and I'll fix that later. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, Cause really it's about uh, replacing the ID and name fields. That's, that's actually the, mo the more salient point. So I mentioned that this was useful having the label and the input, you know, bound together using that four attribute or TH four. It's because um, it allows you to click on the label and it puts that field into focus which can play into some accessibility things. So um, it's uh, a good idea to have your labels and uh, inputs always connected, even if you don't wrap them around one another. So this is a, this is a good way to handle that. Okay, um, let me check, I wanna see it with my slides if I have, yes, okay. So we, we now have this successfully working to where at least when the user gets sent back to the form, <laughs> they don't see, um, they, they don't have to type things in again if they actually did have some things that were perfectly fine. Um, but what we need to do is actually display those error messages that we defined all the way over in the model, right? Because everything's you know bound now, we can do that. So uh, you can add a new error message element. It could be something as simple as a paragraph, but you could use other things, just a div or anything you want. Um, and uh, we're just gonna, for each one of these, we're gonna add, um, one of these. I'm going to say P and I'm going to put a class on here of error just because that's something I've defined in my CSS file, my custom CSS, just to uh, make it red. <laughs> that's what that is. It's just, uh, that's just styling. Um, so that's optional, but here's the, here's the important part. And let me actually finish this. So you want to use this attribute TH errors, and then it just gets the exact same value as TH field, um, where you use the um, uh, variable expression and you know bind it to artwork.title or artwork.artist. Um, wh whichever value one has, that's the dynamic value you want for the other one because it ties them together. Um, and errors already has conditional functionality uh, built in. So it's actually smart enough to know that you don't need to put an extra th if in there, it's built into th errors. So it'll only display it if there is in fact an error for that field. It's pretty cool. 
Uh, and we're not ready for questions yet. Let me finish. Okay. <laughs> um, so we are going to actually um, have uh, this class equals error, and then we'll do th errors and um, put that exact same binding on where we say artwork.title, just like we did up here for th field on the input element. All right. Um, see if I've got all of that. Yep, that's it. And then close the paragraph. And we don't need to put anything in here. We don't need to have a separate like th text because there again, just like th if, th errors handles it all. It knows about the error message coming from the model now. Um, it knows uh, you know, whether or not there's going to be an error because of the rules that we applied with those annotations like not blank and you know min and max. And then um, it will, you know, just either show up or not show up, and it'll have all the information we need. Uh, we're going to put something um, virtually identical here. Uh, just need to change the reference because this one's for the artist. Um, and that should give us exactly what we need. So we're done with these to do's uh, to display these error messages. Let's give it a try here. I'll come over. All right, let's um, go back here fresh. All right, let's uh, hit add. So immediately I tried to submit the form and you see that I've got those error messages below the fields with exactly the wording that came. You know, I didn't put that anywhere in here. It actually comes all the way over from what we provided right here as the message in the model. And the controller's job was just to pass that along. We enabled that with at valid, and then we made sure that um, we stopped it from you know, moving forward to the other page um, so that we could display it by just returning them to the form. And then we bound it uh, by uh, passing in that artwork object, that empty object ahead of time so that it knew about the fields. Uh, so this is how it all works together with all three parts of MVC to make this really easy to define and to implement. Um, and I know it feels like a lot of little, you know, moving parts, and it is a little bit, but honestly, um, having done this from scratch with like, you know, vanilla JavaScript, I can tell you this is <laughs> a lot less work. Um, okay, so uh, that's how we do this. And so that we can prove now that if I um, go ahead and enter, you know, for KISS and then I try it again, now it says, okay, that one's fine, but you still have a problem here. Um, what if I put in a letter A? It's no longer blank, but it still is going to catch it because it's less than two characters. Um, so then I finish it and I put in Gustav Klimt and submit it. And it successfully goes through. It saves it. It displays it on the page. It sends us back to um, the artworks route. Okay. Any more questions about what I've done so far? Yumi? All right, this is going back a bit, but um, would you be able to recap what the difference is between returning a redirect and just returning a path to the page you want to go to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's an important distinction. So um, when you uh, return a string that looks like this, that's not a response body. That means go to templates and uh, look for the template that matches this path. So it goes down here to templates and it goes to artworks and add, right? If you use a redirect, what it actually says is go to this route. And so what happens then is it comes up here and says, okay, this is the controller for slash artworks and I'm making a get request. So this is the one that I want. And now it's going to run this method and give you whatever this points to, which in this case is artwork slash index, which is this template. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Melanie? Um, yeah, I actually had a question about the email annotation. Mm -hmm. um, you had said that with that email annotation that it, requires that you have the .com, but like during the exercises, I tested that and it didn't seem to be the case. Okay. So I'm wondering if there's something more that you have to do to- I could, yeah, I could be wrong about that. So here's here's how uh, we typically do it in the wild. We uh, we, we tend to use um, regular expressions because it's mm -hmm. really, really easy to define a pattern of, of text without having to be specific. Um, and then you can be as specific as you wanna be um, at that okay. point. Yeah. 
um, but yeah, I, I'll have to test that. I know in the um, in the studio exercise for tonight, you'll have an opportunity to work with an email annotation. And yeah. so, yeah, um, I'll go back and I'll play around with that a little bit, see if I can get you a better answer on that one. All right, thanks. Yeah, Emily? Hi, um, when you bound like the title label and the field, like the box, and then you clicked on it and it highlighted yellow, is that something that's defined in the style sheet or um, like, how does that happen, I guess? Um, okay, so there's two parts to that answer. Um, let's go over here. One, the browser has built in, like it's just native to the browser to have this functionality of highlighting this. However, um, the color orange is more likely because I specifically um, uh, allowed for that with my seat, with my styling behind the scenes. So you can, this is called the, the property for the CSS property for this, I think is outline um, when you have it on an input field and you're defining it. So you can change the color of the outline. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So it's a combination of native browser and me styling it differently than what's native. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? I'm going to double check uh, my to do's and make sure there's not anything. Um, we did this one. Really want to make sure I didn't forget anything before we move on to enums after the break. We are going to take a break in a second. Uh, we did this one. Oops, but not that one. <laughs> Handle validation errors. Um, yep, did that. All right, I think uh, I think we actually are good. Um, so let's take a break. Um, and when we come back, we will talk about enumerations from chapter 16 and do a little bit more uh, work on our application.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Let's talk about enumeration types. So this is where you can ensure consistency with fixed input values. It's one of the things that they can be used for. All right, so we'll talk about the fact that enums are actually just Java classes, um, but they have special syntax and we have to cover that. Um, we'll talk about how you assign like specific values and then how you would actually make good use of those in a Spoon Boot app. And then we'll demonstrate it um, in our art gallery application. All right, so an enumeration type is just a special type of Java class, and you can uh, make sure to have a fixed uh, set of values that everyone, you know, has to choose from just those values. And this prevents errors. Um, you know, when you have an a open text input field, people can put anything. You can have issues with typos, case sensitivity, bad spelling, <laughs> or alternate spelling. Maybe it's just not bad, it's just different. Um, or bad information. And we've all seen this. We've all probably come across something in our life where we saw a drop down list where everybody and their brother had just added stuff to it. And you had like three different spellings of the same thing. And one was capital and one was lowercase. And it gets real messy real fast. So this is where um, you know, enumerations are just really helpful. So uh, for user input, um, the example we're going to use is a select uh, that you could have a drop down box. Um, so that they have to choose one of your values and it can't be, um, you know, just anything they type in. And uh, if you want to do any sort of filtering or sorting, it's very important that the values all be, you know, uh, specific and not, and not have variations. Otherwise, it gets real messy, as I mentioned previously. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the syntax for this. Uh, some of the things that are different from a standard Java class, uh, every variable is listed as a constant in all caps uh, using that screaming snake case. Um, and uh, it's comma separated, um, but then the very end of the list needs to have a semicolon on it. So that's kind of different, right? They are static by default. So you don't really add the static uh, keyword. You're always going to just, you're, you're not creating um, objects of this. Um, and that means you access everything by the class name. Um, so uh, that was fast. Okay, hold on. Yeah, so look at this example. We've got this, um, you know, let's say we have this file rainbow.java <laughs> and we've defined a public uh, enumeration rainbow. And we say all of the values are, you know, the, the seven colors, Roy G. Biv, all the way down to Violet. And then if we wanted to reference it, we would just reference it directly on the class name, rainbow.yellow. Um, but it's helpful to have actual like separate values, not, not something in screaming snake case that you want to display on your page, uh, you know, the pretty version of it. Um, so you can uh, create a, a final value um, that will, a final field that will represent that value. And it's very common to use something like display name uh, because it is exactly what you're going to use it for in something like this. Um, and then just use a regular constructor so that you can uh, set that field. But then, um, and you and you add a getter. But here's where it gets weird. You add the you call the constructor from every single value um, that's you know defined up here, and you pass in the specific value for that particular uh, one out of the list. Um, so that value is going to be, yeah, what you make, you know, visible to the user on the page that corresponds with this, you know, so it's a little bit like having a key value pair, but, um, it's, you know, it's actually where you're passing it into a constructor this way. So then when you reference it, um, you'll notice at the bottom here, you know, um, I've got, I've got, you know, I've created display name as a final field. Um, and then I have uh, a constructor and a getter that's not shown here. And then below that, um, no, sorry, elsewhere, not below it, elsewhere, uh, maybe you're ready to make use of this. You would actually say rainbow.yellow.displayName so that you're accessing the, the display name of that particular enum value. Um, so this is going to be important when it comes time to uh, work with things like in our template, in our view. All right, so um, in the model of a Spring Boot app, here's what you would need to do. You want to add a new field to your class that holds one of those fixed values. Um, make sure the type of that field is the name of your class. 
just like you give, you know, if you have something that's an object of another cl uh, class and you're composing with it, uh, you, you use that as the type, right? Same thing with an enum, you use it as the type. Um, and then uh, you just want to make sure it's added to the constructor so that you can pass in that value and have a getter and a setter. And then uh, you also could update your custom two string if you wanted to. In this case, I'm not going to, because the only thing I'm using it for right now is the delete form. And I don't need to say what style the art is on the delete form. But uh, here's how it goes. So I'm going to I'm going to declare um, a private uh, field of the style class, the enum class, and I'm going to call it style. And then in the constructor, I'm going to add that as one of the parameters that gets passed in when you create an artwork object. So we'll set it just like we normally would, and then we'll have a getter and setter for it. Um, but uh, how we actually make those values av available is the interesting part. This looks pretty straightforward, right? Um, this part's not the hard part. Let's go ahead and get this started. We're going to need to create our... Um, actual style enum class first. So I'm going to come up here to models and inside there, I'm just going to say new Java class and I'm going to say um, style and that's, except for I'm going to make it an enum. See how that's an, an option down here? There we go. Yep, okay. And then I'm just going to list my values. So I'm going to say, uh, I want art uh, nouveau, except for it needs to be, yep, there we go. Um, and let's just, uh, yeah, let's do this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put it, uh, put the parentheses there and then we'll fill it out in a second. Um, and impressionism and so on and so forth. And then, you know, uh, I could come down here. Let's just do this for now. I'm going to have more in a second. Uh, I'll create that display name uh, field that we talked about, make it final, string, display name. Okay. Um, and uh, we'll give a constructor and say uh, string display name and say this.display name equals display name. So pretty normal. And then of course we want to have, we can use the thing for this. We can want to have a getter. So we'll add that. All right. So here's where now it knows up here, you can see it's expecting us to pass in that value. So we need to give it the specific values. And so we could, you know, come in here and say uh, art nouveau. This is how we want it to display on the page. Even if this is the actual, you know, enum um, option. So I'm going to uh, just copy and paste the rest of these because I've got six of them. So we'll have six different styles of art here, um, just, just to kind of have some things to work with. Um, and we can make sure that they are, you know, spelled correctly, they're consistent every single time. We can create a dropdown for the form with these. Okay, so that was uh, step one, uh, was creating that. And then um, we wanna go over into our artwork model and create this field. So here we wanna add um, this, uh, we added the class and now we need to actually have the field itself defined. Um, and what I want to do is uh, say, I'm going to put my, I'm going to do my uh, <clears throat> rules for a validation all at once. I'm going to say not null. There we go. And my message is go just going to be style is required um, to make sure that they actually uh, fill this out. And then we'll just have private style style. That's it. And then we'll add it to the constructor. Make sure we give it the type of the class um, and then set it. And then down here, um, right here, I'm gonna add the getter and setter for style and that's it, okay. So we now have this built into uh, artwork as uh, another field that's possible. So uh, we have to still work with it in the view, right? Um, but in the controller, we have to do some work in the controller too, because the only way we can actually display these values on the form is to pass them down to that form, right? Uh, so let's come over. We want to use that model that uh, add attributes to pass that list of all the possible values to the template. 
And we can do that by just saying dot values. Um, it's a built-in method that we'll work with an enum. So we'll come over to the controller, come up here to pass this list of styles. And uh, I have to add, um, oh, I already have model model, so we're good there because we needed it before. So now we're just gonna have to say uh, model.add attribute. Um, I'm gonna call it styles. And we're going to say we want style. And then we're calling this directly on the class, right? Um, style.values. And it'll just give us that list. It's, it's gonna give us something iterable that it can loop through to create each of the options for that select. All right. So this is this is all we needed to do um, to make that possible. Let's go handle this part um, by updating our form. Uh, and so we'll go over to first to the view um, to the, the add template. So we'll come back over to here. I didn't mean to do that. There we go. And we will uh, go ahead and add this select. We're gonna bind it with TH field, just like we did with the title and the artist. Um, and we're going to set these options in place and use TH each to loop through them. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and do that right here. Okay, and also I have a note here to add an empty option that has a value of an empty string. That's so that nothing is chosen and the user has to actually choose something rather than defaulting to a value that may not be correct. Um, and that's a common uh, thing for people to do with, with this sort of thing. All right, so I'm gonna have one more, you'll notice I have a few more um, elements in here than I did last time around when I updated the starter code for this. I'm using uh, these divs to separate these out with this class form item. That's actually, uh, I honestly don't remember if that's um, in my CSS or if it's in uh, Bootstrap, but either way, it helps uh, put these together so that they get styled together. Um, and, and end up on separate lines and you don't end up with the fields all like butted up against one other in line. So that's that's all that is. That's what that class is right there. Okay, so um, here I have uh, a TH4 for the style. I've given it the label and then I have the select field and I've actually used TH field to bind to artwork.style. That's the new field we created, right? That's now part of that model. So it got... Pass, it's getting passed it to the form from the beginning. Um, and this is where it goes. So uh, first option, I just gave it a value of an empty string and closed it. The second one is where I'm actually gonna loop and say, I want a whole bunch of these and I want each one to be a unique style out of all the styles that are in the enum. And then I can access that style for the value, um, which is behind the scenes. The, um, that's the, the you know, value we use in the code. And then the text that is actually displayed to the user, that's where we use style.display name, okay? Um, and then I have another little error message here that just like I did with the others, I used th errors to bind to artwork.style so that it has um, the ability to use, I have to get back to here. It has the ability to use the message that I gave it here and you know that it's supposed to be checking to make sure that this wasn't left um, without anything selected. Okay, so let's uh, let's see. Yeah, so we looped over all the options, um, used that th value, used the th text, and um, so now we should be able to see this on the form. So let's go run it and see what happens. Um, all right. I'm gonna come back over here to the add form and refresh it. All right, so we now have a new field called style. It is a select and you see it has every single one of those print, you know, the, the user-friendly values um, for the display name uh, for each of those enums that are defined in the style class. So that's how we get them on the page just to make it possible for the user to select a, um, a specified value, right? So the next part, and, and I can show how the, the errors thing is functioning. It's saying it's required, you have to do it. Um, and you'll notice that there's a problem though, right? When I did that, uh, suddenly we no longer have access to that list because we've refreshed the um, ad page, or the, you know, the form, but where did that come from? It's in a completely different handler method, right? 
because we might be passing the list here uh, down when it accesses this route, but when we actually just send them directly here, right here, we don't have it. So we need to double this up and we need to put it right here so that when we send them, and we're gonna have to add um, model, model to this, oops. There we go. Um, when we send it, it has it has the exact same list available to it, uh, whether we send it to, <laughs> wow, what just happened? Whether we send it to them from the original handler here or whether we send them there because there's an error we need to send them back. Okay, so if I do this again now, let me restart this. And I come back and refresh this. Let's try adding it now. And then it says style is required, but when I click on this, now I have my list because I, I passed it down in both places. So that's something to keep in mind that if you do a setup like this, where you're going to send somebody back to a form from the post handler, um, if you require information like this to be present on the page when it loads, you have to send it in both places. All right, um, let's see. Uh, Sneha, you have a question? Why can't we just send it to in uh, select options or something like that? I'm not sure what you're asking. Like the, I mean, the, these are kind of like options, right? So right. say if we are using some front end, can we select this? Can we send this to that uh, form options instead? Well, uh, if we want to make use of the enum, then we have to use, we have to go to that, that enum class and use values to get access to it. And so then we just pass it down, pass that list down to the template so that it can then create the actual HTML elements. Oh, okay, makes sense. I yeah. couldn't connect the dots. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's a lot to connect. And and like I said last class, one of the things that's difficult about um, this kind of stuff is that we, we kind of keep simplifying our code more and not making it more complicated um, for, for the time being. And that gets a little bit harder because it suddenly a lot of these things are happening behind the scenes. It springs just doing it for us magically behind a curtain and it's, it's scared. And so you don't always see what the connections are. So yeah, so just to reiterate, um, that's what we're doing in both of these places in both the get handler and the post handler when we send somebody to the add um, form to that template, we're making sure that we grab all of those values from the style enum and pass it um, so that the template, it's the same template, um, but it needs to be able to actually populate using those styles here. So we have to pass it in both places. Okay, so the only other thing now for us to do is to update the table. Uh, we want to actually go to a place where we are displaying the information from the artwork and make sure that these values are now available as well. So uh, you may remember that on our uh, artworks index page, we have a table, right? Um, that uh, has ID, title, and artist. So now we want to add another one called style. And all we have to do now is just uh, update this and just say artwork that style and it will grab whatever style was saved with that object whenever we saved it um, from the from the processing the form and it'll display it all right let's open what this. do you want um display name there yes good catch i thought of it exactly as i was hitting thing and you <laughs> said it so excellent catch that's an easy easy thing to um skip and you're absolutely right because otherwise it's just going to say the you know screaming snake case one <laughs> That's that's not what we want. Okay, uh, so let's uh, go over and check this out. We are going to go back here and add a new artwork. Okay, so we'll say um, Starry Night, Vincent. There we go. Man, I can't seem to type for anything tonight. Okay, and then we're going to go in here and choose pointillism and say add. And there it is. We have four columns now. The fourth one is style and it has the right value with display name, good catch. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, let me see how we're doing on our to-dos. Um, oh, 
we did this one. Okay, I think we actually got it. I think we did everything. So uh, that is that. We have um, more functionality now and uh, our code is making it very, very easy for us to have really good user experience by having these specific messages on each field. And we don't have to do a lot of work in the template for that. All we do is just bind um, using TH field um, to that model and make sure, so I'm gonna work backwards here. So that's what we're doing. Binding hit here, we've got binding with TH errors. And then in the controller, you know, we're enabling uh, error checking with at valid, and then we're handling it by using uh, the errors object we created here and checking to see if it has errors and then have a logic to say, if there's errors, do this. If there's not errors, do this. Um, and all of that works together um, because of the rules that we defined here in the model. So three different parts, M, V, and C, and they're all working together to make this happen. Uh, so let's see, um, any last questions about this? Melanie. Um, I just actually had a question about the, um, could you explain a little bit the difference between not null and not blank? Um, yes, uh, I believe that the <laughs> difference, <laughs> Uh, there are nuances to this that I may, I may not have the full picture, but you definitely want um, not blank uh, in situations where um, it, it might be like an open text field that they can just type anything into. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's say that they accidentally hit the space key and they put a space in there. Um, that would no longer be null. It's, it's not null at all but it is blank. Um, so it will catch things okay. like that. And then um, also uh, I think that, you know, on something like a select, so I chose not null because I, you know, not blank may have worked here because I actually set it the way that I did in the template where I um, created that first option and gave it a value as an empty string. Um, it's possible that not blank would have worked there as well. Um, I'd have to mess around with that to see, but yeah, there are some nuances. Um, you know, I encourage you to look at the documentation um, for this validation and um, you can look up, they've got lots of documentation on each of these um, annotations and yeah. exactly which situations they're used in. Cause it can certainly get a lot more complex if you have uh, more complex forms and more complex classes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mal? Um, yeah, this is about validation, um, and this was from the exercise. I was wondering if you could talk about how to validate a checkbox that needs to be selected. I definitely played around with it a bunch and <laughs> never quite got it working, so I was wondering if you would be able to cover that. Uh, yeah, uh, not quickly, but um, I can say that when you are check oh. There's probably an annotation for that. Um, but uh, one of the things that is is uh, tricky about checkboxes is that there's a checked um, property or like attribute that belongs, like it's just, you know, the browser has it, you know, where you can just like literally put checked on the, the tag and it automatically has it checked. So that's like, that's how you actually like load your page and show something already being checked is by just putting checked on there. You don't even have to say checked equals true. You can just put checked and that automa automatically means checked equals true. So if checked is false, it means it's not checked. Um, but that property will exist whether you have put it there or not because the browser keeps track of it. So it's possible that it could play into that somehow, but I don't know if I've ever tried it. Yeah, I think the closest I got was um, using the annotation assert true, um, mm. but still didn't quite get yeah. it to work. It would be interesting. Yeah, it would be interesting to try it out on um, on my delete form because uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if it would actually. Um, what am I trying to say? 
like right now, the basically you remember the thing that I did to make sure that they didn't like submit it. I, I allow them to submit the form with nothing checked. And we just made sure that we handled it right separately. But as far as be, having something that was actually being run through some sort of rule that was defined in a model that I have not tried. Um, but yeah, maybe I can look into that and see if I can figure something out. Um, okay, uh, Sneha? I just wanted to actually expand on that not null and not blind. So like, I think that, oh, and give an example. I don't remember who asked it, but I feel like it, like it will be more clear in when we learn SQL, but ID is something or which can be not null and not blank. And then let's say we have first name, middle initial and last name. Mm -hmm. And then maybe some people do not do not have the middle initial. So they can be, but we still don't want it to be null. Then it can we can just say we don't want it blank. So not blank uh, and uh, not null both. So we can do both parameters to it. And if we have zip code, which can be both null and uh, blank. But uh, something like, oh, uh, but not blank. So we can just say not null to it. So I think it depends on what we want to be entered in database. We can design it like that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there's definitely going to be, yeah, nuances to that. And it is going to depend, yeah, on how how the how the data relates to other data uh, data too. And so um, because some, some data will be dependent on values from other data. So yeah, those are all good things to think about. Um, we're definitely going to be doing more of this as we add uh, more models and things over the next few weeks. So we'll probably get into some of those nuances. Um, Mohamed? Uh, yes, I was wondering if you can like go over another case where it would be useful to use like uh, enum, like is it just used for like fixed cases where you might need a drop down or is there other useful cases for it? I mean, it can be used for, for just backend stuff like... Um, I mean, it's, it's uh, days of the week, right? Uh, months out of the year. Um, if you want to be able to check something against values and say, does this exist in, in, you know, in here, or do I want to relate it to some sort of other, like, you know, value, kind of like we did with the display name. Um, because if you're checking your data on the back end, just to do, uh, just to manage the data, regardless of what's happening on a front end somewhere, those kinds of things can be really useful to make sure that you're using uh, standard information. And it also might be maybe your company, let's say you have an, a, a company that has three divisions and you want to make sure that those are referred to by a specific name every single time. You can make sure that you have something defined, you have an enum defined with those three specific names so that no matter what developer is working on what, they always use that enum and therefore it's consistent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, I know this is a lot guys, it is, um, but you're gonna get some good practice tonight with your uh, third and final spa day um, studio. It's where you'll be able to add a little bit of validation to that um, user, user uh, class. Okay, so um, you have that alumni panel coming up on Thursday, so there's no lecture. Um, and then I will see you next week um, for on Monday for the first of the two SQL chapters. Um, and that's uh, again, that's a separate curriculum. So you'll have a link to that um, in, you should have a link to that in Canvas. And then um, make sure, I just wanna encourage you guys, if, if you let it slide sometimes and don't do the reading and, <laughs> and the exercises before you come to lecture, you may want to make sure you do that for SQL because it's a total shift from everything we have been doing so far. It's got its own language and its own rules. So um, make sure you try to do uh, that prep work ahead of class and that will help you tremendously be able to stick with me during the lecture. Um, and then you'll have a catch up class on Thursday because you've got that great assignment due the following Monday and that is when we will finish up uh, SQL part two before we return back to our spring stuff. Um, Sneha, did you have one more question? Yes, I do. Uh, so the, about this Thursday, is it going to be all 5.30 to 8.30 alumni panel or we get some time uh, with our TAs too? Uh, I think it's 
I think, I believe you just treat it like a catch-up class where you can go to your TA, your studio groups and just work on stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about your studio tonight. I kind of already said it, but yeah, same project, just switch to that user sign up part two branch. Um, you're gonna add some validation annotations in your class to set the rules for some of the fields because um, you've got you know username and uh, email and password, right? Um, you'll modify the controller to make sure you enable error handling first of all, and then handle it. Um, and then uh, you're going to you know make the updates in the view to put error messages on the page. And then the bonus mission actually has you, uh, try to convert the verification of the password from the manual validation you were doing before and actually set it into the model so that it can just be done the same way that the other fields are being done. Um, and I will, of course, have a, a video, uh, you know, demonstrating how to go through all of that later on um, that you can refer to. But for now, um, you know, pair up with somebody else and uh, talk it through and get it done. You guys will uh, learn a lot in the process. All right, you guys have a great night and I will see you uh, not on Thursday, but next Monday for SQL part one.